So I'm going to be talking about uh, roughly a period of 250 years, uh, so we'll try to fit that into 45 minutes or so, um, encompassing <clears throat> You know, from the from the middle of the 15th century, really, to the end of the 18th century, uh, a period which encompasses uh, the uh, you know what is often called the Renaissance, the the Reformation, and towards the end of the period, what we call the Enlightenment, um, a period of the great bourgeois revolutions, uh, essentially, um, which represents two and a half centuries of basically the most immense uh, class battles, uh, a struggle of living forces that went on for two and a half centuries. Uh, battles that weren't just fought out on the battlefields and on the barricades, although there were plenty of those in, in this period, um, but which was also fought out on the plane of religion, on the plane of philosophy, and on the plane of science, uh, as well as art and every other um, sphere of human culture. <clears throat> And it was a period which, uh, in many respects, is, uh, was much like our own is. <laughs> that is to say, it was a period in which an old social system was, uh, was, was dying on its feet, uh, but was refusing to leave the stage of history, and in which a new social system was basically struggling to be born. Um, <clears throat> and in the course of these struggles, uh, you had thrown up uh, throughout this period a galaxy of some of the most brilliant thinkers, some of the, some of the boldest thinkers who defied persecution by the, uh, the religious establishment and the church, and who sought to carry out <clears throat> a wholesale revolution, really, in human thinking, to liberate human thought from mysticism, from the, from the fog of, uh, of superstition. Uh, and they fought for rationalism, they fought for science, they fought for human reason, and they fought, the, 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 the boldest of those thinkers amongst them, fought for a militant form of materialism. Now, Engels described it as a time which called for giants and produced giants. Um, and I think that's very much, uh, that's very much the case. Now, the, the roots of this crisis uh, in this period that we're talking about obviously have uh, their origins in uh, the dying feudal order, which had dominated Europe basically for centuries. In fact, Europe had been through a period of basically a millennium of darkness, effectively, uh, since the collapse of the Roman Empire. Populations had collapsed, centers of culture had declined. Um, it was almost literally a period of darkness insofar as not just were the ancient Greek texts of, of science and philosophy lost, but the ancient Greek language was completely lost, basically, for, much of, for, for the majority of Europe in this period. Um, and it was a, uh, uh, in proportion, as the, uh, the, the centers of culture declined and, and Europe entered an epoch of, of backwardness, the strength of the Catholic Church increased its grip, basic, basically a vice-like grip over the minds of men and women throughout this period. And um, the, uh, the, the, they, the, the Church, of course, provided the ideological, uh, was an ideological bulwark and really a part fused in with the, uh, the new feudal ruling class, basically. The, the, the Church was part of that. And um, this was reflected in the, uh, in the role that uh, philosophy basically played throughout this period. The only purpose that philosophy and natural philosophy and science formed part of philosophy actually until the scientific revolution uh, starting in the 15th century, the only purpose that it played basically was to, to glorify um, God's, cre God's creation and our natural place effectively within it. And that was also reflected in the elements of uh, ancient Greek thought that were preserved throughout this period, which were uh, limited to uh, uh, limited amounts of Plato's ideas and a homeopathic dose of uh, Aristotle's thinking. And Plato in particular, his <clears throat> His views formed the philosophical basis of the, of the thought, which was predominant in the, in, in the period of the Middle Ages, you know, in the monasteries amongst the monks and the, all the different schools of philosophy. And his, fundamentally, his world outlook was an idealist outlook. That is to say, he inverted the relationship. It, for, for Plato, the relationship between mind and matter was inverted. It is mind which is primary and matter which was secondary, basically. I mean, basically, Plato divided the world effectively in two. We have this world around us, which is which is mortal, which is imperfect, um, and which is in a constant process of change. And then we have a second world, which is the world of our conceptions, which are, which are perfect, which are immortal, and which for Plato have an objective existence independent of this material world. And in fact, this material world is merely an imperfect reflection of this world of ideal forms. This was the essence of Plato's idealism, basically. And the Christian church took this on board and gave it its own spin, of course, that they rejected, they, they encouraged people to reject this sinful mortal realm. And if, they want, if you wanted to seek real knowledge, it had to be knowledge of that uh, spiritual ideal realm, effectively. And that knowledge was to be grasped 
of course, by the means of divine revelation, through faith. It was through faith that you were going to gain knowledge and insight into that other, that other realm, basically. And uh, the, the, the mode of thinking which dominated throughout the medieval period was known as uh, scholasticism, basically. It took these you know, texts which were based upon faith, you know, the, and, and dogma and the fact that the church had sanctified them. Um, a small uh, infusion of philosophy and, of course, the Bible and other religious texts and the commentaries upon those texts. And uh, knowledge was sought by basically uh, applying syllogistic logic, formal logic, to these texts to draw out further truths. So you have commentaries upon these, you know, given texts and then commentaries upon commentaries. Um, and it, it, a huge amount of intellectual energy was basically exhausted um, uh, commenting upon and, uh, and debating uh, utterly uh, nonsensical ideas. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the idea of scholastic, scholastic philosophers debating the, uh, the, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin is basically, you know, the kind of uh, a caricature, but it wasn't far from that, basically. Francis Bacon, who we'll meet later on, a 16th century English materialist, described the endeavours of the medieval schoolmen <clears throat> as like the spider who worketh his web and brings forth indeed cobwebs of learning, admirable for the fineness of thread and work, but of no substance or profit. Um, in other words, you know, they were very intelligent people, but they were just working, they weren't looking out into the external world to, for, to, to seek knowledge, basically. They were working it up from within themselves, effectively, producing these cobwebs of knowledge. And what I think is interesting listening to Bacon Bacon's uh, words is how applicable they are to modern academia, basically. You know, this idea of, you know, cobwebs of knowledge produced from within themselves, you know, the commentaries upon commentaries of the, of the medieval scholastic philosophers. Just like the textual analysis, the discourse, you know, the, uh, uh, it's, it's all based upon basically the same fundamental idealist uh, notions and methods, basically, of the, the medieval schoolmen. They are, modern academia really are the, uh, the, the, the inheritors of the scholastic tradition, not the Enlightenment tradition in some respects. And um, to the extent that that means anything. And um, I think it's no coincidence, basically, that for, for the uh, many schools of academics, such as like the Frankfurt School and the postmodernists, independently have come to the conclusion that they reject the Enlightenment. And what they basically mean by the rejection of the Enlightenment is, is the rejection of, uh, of rationality, of reason, of the possibility of, of gaining a rational insight into the material world through scientific empirical investigation, and the rejection of materialism. And I think this, you know, this, this rejection of the Enlightenment, of the postmodernists and these others, is really a, a sign of how far the bourgeois have declined, you know, of, of how, how, uh, how spiritually pauperized they have basically become. Um, because in their revolutionary youth, um, they, they represented uh, the progress of human civilization. The capitalist class, they stood, or, or their best representatives, should I say, they stood for reason, rationality, the scientific method. Um, and they produced these brilliant thinkers. Because at that time, they did represent progress. Um, because unlike the feudal lords, whose wealth was based fundamentally upon land, this nascent bourgeois class, of course, their industry was, their, their wealth was based upon industry, sorry. And therefore, their wealth, in, increased at that time in tandem with every advance in science and production and technology which created the basis for new productive techniques, for new methods of navigation and the expansion of trade routes. And their intellectual needs of this nascent class were fundamentally and utterly incompatible, basically, with the stifling atmosphere of the, of, of the domination, this dictatorship of the Catholic Church over the minds of, of, of men and women throughout Europe. And you begin to see the first elements of, of, of an intellectual ferment preparing the way for a revolution, basically, um, in, in the material world and also a revolution in, in culture. Um, you begin to see that as early in the, as the 12th and 13th century in the form of a crisis of scholasticism. And this crisis was actually provoked by the rediscovery, either translated from the Arabic or the rediscovery of the ancient Greeks, uh, of the ancient Greek originals, of uh, the writings of Aristotle, who was, a, who was a disciple of Plato, but unlike Plato, he was fundamentally a materialist, basically. He, he emphasized investigation of nature, of experiment, and so forth. And his, his students even had a phrase, you know, there is nothing in the mind which was not first in the senses. That is the starting point of a materialist outlook, and it created a crisis. But it was in many ways really only the, uh, the, the, the harbinger of a, of, a, of a greater revolution in philosophy and science to come, which really begins in the mid-15th century. And its center is in northern Italy. And it was kicked off, of course, 
um, by a, a, a man known as Nicholas Copernicus, who, who wrote a book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres uh, from his deathbed, I think, in 1543, actually. Uh, from his deathbed, it, for, for, for a reason. He had a certain trepidation uh, of what the consequences for himself might be, because he understood, uh, rightly, that this was uh, laying down the gauntlet to the, uh, to the church, basically. This was a revolutionary challenge to the old outlook of the helio sorry, the, the geocentric, earth-centered universe was basically part of the, the cosmology of the church, which justified, it was part of the justification of our place within God's creation, uh, which we must accept with resignation. Um, and therefore, to place the, the sun at the center of the universe was a serious challenge um, at that time. And um, th this was a, a, you know, this scientific revolution was not limited to Copernicus's discoveries. You also had discoveries in this period on magnetism, the circulation of the blood uh, in engineering, and, and actually industry and technology played a massive advance in spurring all of these, uh, these discoveries and, and advances in science. And in the early 1600s, it was a discovery from industry in particular, the Dutch invented telescope. Uh, which, which played a revolutionary role in the hands of one of the great revolutionaries of this period. And in my opinion, the true father of the Enlightenment, along with uh, figures like Francis uh, Bacon and, and, and um, Descartes. And that is uh, Galileo, who, who took the telescope and he, he directed it up towards the heavens. Uh, and he made observations that he, he didn't just limit himself to these observations. Uh, he also studied terrestrial mechanics. He studied the whole of existing physics as it had been sort of inherited by him. And he carried out, a, a, basically pushed forward a revolution in the whole of the existing understanding of the natural universe, not just in astronomy and terrestrial mechanics, in, in a whole series of, 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 of areas affecting physics, basically. Um, and uh, now the full weight of the Inquisition was brought down upon on Galileo. He was uh, silenced by the church, even before before Galileo had published his, uh, his landmark uh, writings, um, uh, Giordano Bruno was, uh, was burnt at the stake uh, for advocating the most modern of ideas, to be honest. Uh, Bruno was uh, an incredible thinker. Uh, and and, and uh, basically, the, the, the intellectual life of Northern Italy was to a large degree snuffed out by the church. In proportion, as this challenge came up from below and their grip was being loosened upon the minds of men and women, they resorted to terroristic methods of the Inquisition to crush uh, the, the, the intellectual life of this uh, that, that was bubbling away basically but it was too late uh, Galileo's uh, uh, revolution had uh, left its mark on the whole of the subsequent century really the whole subsequent 17th and 18th century and on philosophy in particular and um, in, in his, his revolution uh, began flowing into the stream of another revolution that was happening simultaneously um, and parallel and that was in philosophy and its um, center really was in England, uh, where you had the restatement and the systematic uh, development of materialist philosophy for the first time in the modern period. And its originator was Francis Bacon, who I, who I previously mentioned, three years Galileo senior. He was, uh, um, he was a man quite unlike um, Galileo in a sense. He was not a revolutionary. Uh, in fact, he, uh, I think he was Lord Chancellor under James I. And uh, he didn't even intend to carry out, I mean, we think of materialism quite rightly is in antagonism to religion and mysticism. He was not a religious uh, reformer or a revolutionary in religion, basically. Like a lot of the materialists in England, actually, you'll see that they didn't really want to challenge the established order or even the church. And uh, in fact, he dodged a conflict with the church by basically saying, well, God is unknowable to either uh, our sense perception or to human reason. You can only know God through faith. So let's leave God to one side <laughs> and let's look at the material world and the world we're familiar with. It was a bit of a backhanded compliment to God that just batted him away, basically. Um, but nonetheless, you know, on, on the primary questions that, that concerned him, uh, Bacon was a, was a materialist. Um, you know, he regarded uh, matter as being primary and uh, the, uh, the ideas in our mind are a reflection of the material world around us. And knowledge, he explains, could only be had, could only be accessed through empirical investigation of nature, through our senses. Our senses form a window onto the external world. This is the basis of, uh, of empiricism, but it's also the, the starting point of materialism and it's the starting point of the scientific method, actually. It is a correct observation to say that is the starting point of our knowledge. Science begins um, by making observations and collecting facts about the outside world. Um, but how does that scientific method progress according to, to, to Bacon, who is rightly regarded as the 
systematizer of the scientific method in the 17th century, contemporary with these great advances in science? Well, um, of course, we take particular facts and particular observations. Uh, and then, of course, what we do is we discard what is non-essential about those things, what they, what, uh, and we, we seek what they have in common, basically. And then we draw out universal conclusions. So, in other words, through the method of what we, know, we call today induction, uh, we go from the particular to the universal. That's how uh, science takes place. You know, you have particular data points on a piece of graph paper, and after you've got enough data points, you can draw a, uni a, 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 a trend, basically. Um, that is how, uh, of course, uh, science uh, um, develops, according to Bacon. Um, and indeed, yes, it is, the start, it is the correct starting point of a materialist outlook. But the question is, is it only by our sense perception alone that we come to knowledge? Is it only by sensing the world that we know the world? Now, of course, the answer is no. It's not, of course, simply by sensing things that we, we know the world. As soon as we begin to sense the world, of course, we begin to process the, 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 you know, the world in our brain. We begin to seek some rational insights, some make generalizations, basically. Um, and then, uh, having made those generalizations, having uh, gained some insight, basically, our reason in turn affects what we then further observe, right? <laughs> it's all right. Uh, we um, obviously. Uh, what we decide to go out and observe, the significance we place upon observations is informed by our reason itself. You know, if I've lost my phone, I'm not going to look everywhere in this building for my phone. I'm going to retrace my steps. I'm going to bring reason into the equation, you know. If I'm a, a, a biologist and I'm carrying out, you know, a comparative anatomy of, say, zebras and horses, and I decide to dissect them and look at their tissues and, uh, uh, and, and organs, you know, I come with a certain amount of knowledge to those investigations, right? The idea of species, the idea of tissues, the idea of organs, organs, uh, it determines what I look for. The, scientific, the scientist comes with a hypothesis. So there is a dialectical interaction between reason and observation. The two are two parts of the same process. Which furthermore is not also, you know, the, the, the gaining of knowledge is also not an individual, uh, you know, process. It is a social process, actually. Most of what the science that you know isn't because you individually have done those experiments. Uh, you may have done some of them, but, um, uh, you know, I've never proved that the atom exists. But I know that someone has done it, and I've read, the, that I've read those experiments and the results of those experiments. It is a social process, actually. And knowledge is a social phenomenon. It is not an individual phenomenon. Um, so there are many different sides to knowledge, but of course this, uh, the, the, and, and the sense impressions are only one of those basically. Um, the question, is, the, 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 the issue was with English uh, materialism, um, this, this new materialist uh, school that was developing, it, it had the potential for a many-sided development, but in the hands of the, the, the successors to Bacon, it was really developed in a very one-sided way. This question of sense impressions was developed and, and empirical investigation, empiricism, this school became known as, uh, became um, really a very one-sided emphasis upon this side of knowledge. Um, to the exclusion of reason, basically, in human activity. And the reaction to that was actually the development of a parallel school uh, of, of, of thinking, uh, with its, uh, which was based primarily in France, uh, which was centered in France, uh, which emphasized the other side of human knowledge, of reason. And these were the rationalists, the great rationalist ph philosophers. Um, and of course, as, as, as you might expect, the rationalists starting with Descartes, they, they placed a great deal of emphasis on reason rather than empirical observation. And this, this, this tendency did have a strong uh, leaning in the direction, therefore, of idealism. The idea that we can simply deduce things from mind, from, from f simple facts that are uh, obvious to our innate human reason. We can deduce certain things in the manner of logical or mathematical proofs about the world. Um, of course, that is, a, that is a legitimate method, but emphasizing that, of course, to the exclusion of empirical um, uh, observation can lead in the direction of, uh, of, of, of idealism, obviously. But precisely because of the one-sided character of materialism, as I'll go on to, it was actually, uh, there was a great contributions uh, were developed by the idealist philosophers. And in particular, of course, it was through idealism that we came to the rediscovery of dialectics in the modern period. Although, as I'll come on to, not all of the rationalist philosophers were by any means clear-cut idealists. Um, but back to um, back to the English materialists for now, um, who were basically who came after Bacon. They very much developed materialism in this one-sided way. They very much developed it in a, a purely mechanical sense, and they regarded matter effectively 
as uh, as being as all of matter is describable in terms of mechanical motion. Now, what do I mean by mechanical motion? I mean uh, motion, bulk motion, as we as it's described by the laws of physics. But Newton, of course, was the one to definitively describe the mathematical laws of, uh, of, of physics later on. Um, but basically, this this motion takes place through uh, uh, um, you know like like Newton's law. You know, things basically uh, continue moving in a straight line, undeflected, basically, unless there is some sort of uh, impulse from the outside. Matter itself is fundamentally inert for the mechanical materialist. It's not self-moving, basically. Um, and it is only through physical impact, through collision, that motion is produced. Uh, and therefore, I mean, Locke himself says it, we observe matter only to transfer but not to produce any motion. It's a very inert sort of uh, character of, uh, of, of, or notion of motion. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't do that intentionally. Um, thank you. And so, um, yeah, we have this, this impression of the world basically as lots of interlocking parts that are bumping into each other and causing a cascade of, causing a cascade of, uh, of, of simple causes and effects which can be easily delineated from each other, much like a piece of mechanics. And that was how the world was seen, as, as like a piece of clockwork, basically. Um, and uh, precisely because everything could be described as in terms of mechanical motion, therefore all of the qualities of nature which we see around us were fundamentally reducible to the properties of mechanical motion. Uh, all of the qualities of nature could be described in terms of trajectory, speed, shape, you know, different geometrical qualities, uh, hardness and penetrability, these sort of things were the fundamentally everything could be reduced to this. It was a very reductionist outlook effectively and um, you know ironically it was it was a distortion that was caused by the rapid advance of astronomy and uh, and mechanics of terrestrial mechanics uh, in the hands of great ge geniuses like Galileo and others um, that precisely because these sciences went further ahead than the others you know it wasn't until the end of the 18th century really that chemistry became a real science with the discovery of oxygen it wasn't until the 19th century with Darwin in biology <laughs> Um, that therefore everything, it was, it was informed by the science of its time. The form that materialism took was very much informed by the, uh, the, the science of the time. Descartes, for example, um, even described the human body as effectively being like, like a machine, basically, albeit one inhabited by a soul. And uh, Hobbes, who was a contemporary of Descartes, and uh, Hobbes lived a, a time of incredible storm and stress. Um, he, he lived in the course of the, uh, the English Civil War. He lived through these great events. Ironically, although he is a, a, probably one of the best representatives of bourgeois materialism, he was a royalist, actually. He was a reactionary. And uh, he was therefore forced to flee to, uh, to, to France, um, where he wrote some of his great texts. And he actually analyzed the state as a little bit like the mechanical clumping together of atoms forms us as human beings. The, the mechanical clumping together of, of men uh, basically uh, forms the, this great monster, the Leviathan, the state, basically. Uh, it's the, 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 the necessary evil with the autocrat at its head who is necessarily sort of bringing order amidst the brutish and, and selfish competition of human beings that he very cynically imagined that, that, that we were of this sort of character. Um, um, it was a very mechanical sort of interpretation, but you can see actually it's, it, 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 it came with certain personal dangers to advocate these views in France for uh, Hobbes because uh, of course it also strips the state of its divine justification. And so he was forced in the 1650s to uh, appeal to Cromwell to return back to, uh, uh, to England, which he, he was able to do. Um, so you can see there's a seed of a revolutionary idea there, but Hobbes was far from a revolutionary. He was a, he was a pragmatic uh, bourgeois materialist who could make peace with a, uh, you know, an absolute monarch or a lord protector at the same time. You know, he was a, a practical materialist of a bourgeois sort of outlook. Um, but ultimately, because actually of this empiricist uh, development of materialism, this very mechanical uh, development, the um, empiricism itself uh, as developed by Hobbes and Locke, and particularly those that came after them, would actually find itself in a dead end philosophically. It would find itself ensnared when taken to its, uh, its extreme and therefore absurd conclusion, it would find itself actually in the realm of subjective idealism. Now for the, um, yeah, for the mechanical materialists like Hobbes and, and Locke, we interact with the world just as the world interacts with itself by, by very mechanical sort of uh, motions where our sense organs are basically like buttons being pressed externally by the, uh, the world around us. And that is how we receive knowledge. It's a very passive notion of knowledge, basically. And in fact, 
John Locke described the mind as effectively like a tabula rasa, a blank slate, which is empty until the senses are impacted by the, uh, the outside world. Um, you know, our, our senses basically write upon our minds. They fill our minds with content, which is empty until such thing, you know, as our senses fill it with uh, knowledge. Um, but immediately, actually, this, this very mechanical conception of things sets up an op a, 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 a sort of duality um, with, uh, 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 effectively, which became a serious problem for empiricism. It, 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 it places an opposition between cause and effect, between the sense organ and that which impacts upon the sense organ, uh, between an outer objective world and a sort of uh, passive inner subjective world. Uh, in other words, it, it sets up an opposition between mind and matter, basically which is an inheritance from, uh, well, from the Middle Ages, really. Uh, it's, it, it, it falls into the same fundamental problem. And, uh, in fact, uh, the, it raises a question. You know, if, if, our, um, if all we have are our sense impressions, basically, they are the interface between that outer objective world and this inner subjective world, which are completely distinct from one another, um, if all we have are our sense impressions which tell us about that outer world, how can we know that they actually give um, any real impression of that outer world, basically? Uh, how do we know that the world is the way it is, uh, as our senses tell us it is? Um, how do we even know that there is anything beyond our sense impressions, actually? Um, that's the sort of question that is raised by this sort of duality of, uh, the, of falsely stating the problem in this kind of, uh, in this kind of way. And even, even Locke, who... Um, uh, he, he's largely regarded as a materialist, but even he um, basically raised a question mark over even the existence of a material world. He describes matter um, as merely the something we know not what, the supposed but unknown support of those qualities we find existing. So, I mean, he's not exactly sure himself whether there is a material world. Um, now, the solution to this problem was actually um, provided or indicated, really, by one of the great rationalist philosophers, and that was by um, Baruch Spinoza, um, who, who lived in the Netherlands, although he was of, um, uh, I think, uh, Jewish Sephardic or, um, ancestry. And uh, he, he explains that the solution to this problem, basically, which is that there is only one world. There is, there is no fundamental separation between the objective and the subjective. Uh, he regarded ex extension, i.e., you know, um, extension in geometrical space and the properties of mechanical motion, and thought and ex experience and these sort of things as basically two qualities, two aspects of the same fundamental thing, uh, which he calls substance, effectively. And that is very much the case. You know, we're not simply passively receiving uh, sense impressions from the world outside of us. We're not separate and apart from that. We have a material brain, of course, inside our material body, which is as much part of the material world um, as, uh, as anything else. And uh, yeah, for, for, for Spinoza, everything was made of this one substance, i.e. he was a monist. He didn't set up this dualistic separation between mind and matter. But for, for Spinoza, of course, this, uh, as, as Alan explained last night, this substance was God, um, effectively, in a very, in a kind of pantheistic manner. Everything is God. I am God, you are God, the chairs and tables are God. Um, but of course, if everything is God, then nothing is God, basically. It kind of reduces the, uh, you know, the mystical element of, of, of God into Entirely. Um, God is effectively a byword for matter in that kind of, you know, idealism. So it's, it's a kind of I idealism that is, for all intents and purposes, materialistic, basically. It comes very close to a materialist worldview. But, um, yeah, once more returning to Locke and the downfall, really, of English uh, materialism. Um, now, Locke, well, he lived at the end, really, of a revolutionary period in British history. Um, uh, the, the, the period of, this, of the, uh, the 17th century, the period in which you had the great English Civil War, the Restoration, and then towards the end of the century, you had the Glorious Revolution, which was uh, very much the time uh, that Locke was, uh, was, 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 was writing. He had uh, gone into exile, I believe, to the Netherlands in the time of the Restoration and returned from exile when a, uh, a Dutch adventurer, William of Orange, was invited to take the throne of England from, the, uh, 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 from James II. Um, and it was a time, basically, in which the, the, the revolutionary potential of the British bourgeois was becoming exhausted now. Uh, they were actually set, they were, they were basically compromising with the elements of the old order that was still existing, you know, with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the church, the, 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 the monarchy, who was, in, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, you have this co constitutional monarchy, the House of Lords, these remnants of feudalism, and they came to a compromise basically with the old uh, aristocracy in which the bourgeois would effectively have power and be able to make money um, in, 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 in the means in which they... Uh, um, which, which was their fundamental priority, basically. And um, Locke's um, philosophy was fundamentally in keeping with the spirit of, of his time, basically. Um, he, his, his philosophy was a practical but inconsistent philosophy. Um, it had materialist elements, but it doubted the existence of matter. You know, it left, just like uh, um, Newton, uh, it left room open for God, despite the fact that you had this mechanical universe, which would continue on its motions for all eternity. It allowed room for a prime mover who would have the, the great role of just setting the whole thing in motion. It was not exactly like the, the God of uh, the Old Testament that could turn people to pillars of salt. It was... Uh, rather less than that. Um, so it was very much in, 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 in the spirit of, uh, of the time of, of compromising inconsistency basically of the British bourgeois. Um, but as I say, having arrived in power, the British bourgeoisie were determined to put a, an end to this period of storm and stress. They became, they became basically increasingly skeptical of anything that smacked of revolution or even of materialism. And therefore a period of, of philosophical reaction effectively set in. And in the 18th century, the immediate successors of Locke in, uh, in, uh, in England, um, actually, I think Hume was, a Sc was Scottish, was he not? And, uh, and actually, Bishop Barclay was Irish. So. <laughs> uh, but they still, they nonetheless form part of this tradition of, of sort of British empiricism. Um, they very much indeed did take empiricism to its logical and absurd conclusion. And Hume precisely denies the possibility of knowing whether there even is a material world out there be, you know, beyond our senses. Um, and the, the logical conclusion of that is actually that all I can be sure of is that I exist. You know, solipsism, the, the, the idea that I exist but I'm not sure any of you exist or the, the material world around me exists. That's the, 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 the logical and... Uh, you know, completely sterile conclusion, basically, of this, uh, of this empiricism. And, and Barclay, he went further. He, he denied that there was a material world at all. All we have are our sense impressions. There's no evidence for a material world. Um, in fact, it's a leap of faith what we actually believe gives order to these sense impressions. And therefore, he believed it was God simply implanting these ideas in our heads, basically. So you see how this one-sided materialism sort of ran into a dead end and was taken to um, the, the extreme of subjective idealism by people like Hume and Bishop Barclay. And it reflected the reaction of the British bourgeoisie um, in, in that period of time. But if, um, if materialism died a death in England in the 18th century, it had a brilliant revolutionary rebirth in, uh, in France in the same period. Now, by the 18th century, um, French conditions were increasingly coming into uh, a, a conflict with the existing, um, uh, the existing state of affairs, basically, was coming into conflict with the state, the old ruling class, the old Ancien Regime, was in conflict with the progress of society, basically. Uh, the whole thing was teetering on the edge of collapse. Um, you had uh, a series of wars, uh, with England and, and with uh, European powers in which the, the French were dealt heavy blows um, and, and of course the, the national debt was increasing and who was, who was forced to pay that uh, debt? It was the third estate basically, i.e. not the first two estates of the clergy and the noblemen. They, were, uh, they, they didn't have to, uh, they had a say in everything but they didn't have to pay any taxes. It was the, it was the third estate, i.e. the increasingly wealthy bourgeoisie uh, who were, represented the majority of the wealth of the nation who had to who had to pay for these, uh, what they regarded as senseless wars. Um, in other words, the French bourgeois were coming into an acute conflict with the whole of the existing order, with the clergy, with the aristocracy, with the monarchy, and uh, a revolution was brewing. Um, a revolution that would eventually end, of course, yes, precisely as we say, with the, with the fall of the Bastille, with the fall of the, uh, the monarchy, and with the beheading of a monarch, um, and, uh, and the, the beheading of much of the, uh, the old aristocracy, basically. But in order to prepare uh, the, the ground for what would be an extremely thoroughgoing revolution in France, it was necessary to prepare the minds of men and women for this tremendous overthrow of the old order. In other words, society he was crying out basically for a philosophy, for an outlook, um, an outlook of the, the, this revolutionary class in the ascent of the revolutionary element within the French bourgeois. And it was in these conditions that actually it was 
ironically the quite conservative compromising gentleman that was John Locke his ideas were, were brought to France by a guy called Condillac um, and um, given a completely new content basically this this English materialism when it was imported into France um, in the hands of a, of, of, a, of a series of brilliant thinkers including Holbach, Helvetius and Diderot um, who were in turn closely aligned with the, the, the great social theorists although or not really philosophers um, Rousseau and Voltaire whose names are synonymous with the, the, the great revolutions of the 18th century and um, and that they, they, they took this materialism, this English materialism, and they filled it with a new revolutionary content, basically. Um, and uh, it reflected the fact that the French Revolution was basically being fought on a higher level uh, than the, the English Revolution. Which it, The English Revolution was fought on the basis of a purified religion, of a puritanical sort of religious war against the old regime. The French Revolution was fought on, under the banner of, of reason and of creating a rational society of, of, of liberty, equality and justice, basically. Um, and in the same way that the, uh, the, the, the French Revolution itself was fought to, uh, to its logical conclusion, um, the, uh, the, the French materialism was also taken to its logical conclusion. The, uh, the great French materialists, they didn't shirk the, uh, the logical conclusion of materialism. It's, it's anti-clerical, it's anti-religious, it's atheistic side, it's revolutionary edge, which people like you know, Hobbes and, uh, and Locke were very much not of that character. You know, these, these people, um, they, they, they intended to turn uh, materialism into a weapon against the, the gods and the church and the monarchy and the whole of the existing order uh, the existing order which was deemed irrational by these thinkers um, they denied the divinity of, uh, of, of monarchs and they declared that the highest good was that which led to the the, the greatest happiness of, of human beings basically um, which and, and, and as I say it was it was very far from the the, the cynical self-serving materialism of someone like Hobbes who believed that you know we as human beings are naturally brutish and uh, and, and selfish and therefore we need uh, an, uh, some sort of authoritarian uh, strong hands that's going to sort of bring law and order no these these materialists were um, they believed that uh, if you elevated human conditions you could also elevate human beings basically we needed to liberate men and women from the awful conditions these barbaric conditions which create a barbaric culture and society um, and uh, therefore they believed it was possible to reorganize society on the basis of human reason rather than on the basis of superstition and unlike those uh, you know superstitious thinkers who thought that um, uh, who preached a, a better life after death they said well no on the contrary suffering is not something that was created by original sin it doesn't go back to Adam and Eve and all of these sort of things um, suffering is an ill produced by society and we can get rid of it basically by uh, revolutionizing society um, you know we can have heaven here on earth basically or not at all was the philosophy of the French materialist in other words you can see already the direction is being pointed forward towards how materialism connects to communism Communism. You can see that in French materialism. It's already pointing in that direction. Um, you know, to change men, you have to change their material conditions and make them more humane fundamentally. Marxism owes a direct debt of gratitude, really, to the French materialists, who, uh, in turn, you know, these uh, um, these these brilliant writers and and really that they, they, they were. I mean, Marx, I think, regarded Diderot as his favorite essayist. They were. Their, their works were pulsating with life. You know, they were really vivacious, um, uh, bold thinkers who, who also, you know, they harnessed all of the latest developments in science. They were really keenly interested in science. In fact, Diderot himself um, led the, uh, the, the editorial, basically, of, of an encyclopedia which aims to bring together all of human knowledge of the time in science, in philosophy, in social theory, all of these ideas into a great encyclopedia for which he wrote about 7,000 articles himself. He was a very prolific man um, and um, yeah he, he, he thought that basically science was the way to liberate humanity it was through reason getting rid of the fog of superstition um, and and he came under uh, th this encyclopedia was basically uh, banned by the church and by the French state at the time uh, he fa you know that th these people were prepared to face um, serious personal persecution these were self-sacrificing individuals who believed that they were doing what they were doing for the good of humanity um,
and they, uh, yeah, they're, 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 their ideas are full of, um, of, of, this, of this really genuinely bold and revolutionary spirit. And uh, in, in fact, these, uh, the, the, the direct, um, there is a direct link really between French materialism and Marxism, precisely actually through the utopian socialist. Fourier himself was directly inspired by French materialism. Robert Owen uh, was more indirectly inspired by the ideas of Helvetius. Um, and, um, you know, Robert Owen precisely wanted to, to elevate uh, men and women by creating decent conditions for them in the factories. He was very much an, a materialist himself, uh, basically. Um, and even Lenin in the, uh, in the 20th century, in, uh, after the Bolsheviks had come to power, in a, in a short article he wrote, he, he showed there is still life and, and an, a sharp edge, effectively, to these great French materialist writers. He, uh, he wrote a little article on the significance of uh, militant materialism. And in the war against uh, the, the, the influence of the church and of mysticism in the countryside in Russia to awaken the intellectual life of the Russian peasantry, he actually advised Russian communists to translate the, the writings of the great French materialist precisely to awaken that, that, that mood of critical thinking and of rationalism amongst the peasants. Um, and precisely because it, 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 it contrasted, uh, it had so much color in contrast with some of what he, he described as the sort of uh, um, like the, the gray copied texts of the Mar you know, so-called Marxist literature, which he, was, he, he thought was of a deplorably low quality um, at that time. Um, so we, I think, uh, um, can we owe obviously a great deal. I think there is a direct uh, heritage, really, that, that Marxism owes to, the, to this brilliant school of French materialism. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it is worth pointing out, of course, that the French materialists suffered from all of the defects of, of English materialism. Basically, it was uh, very much an un, an undialectical materialism, uh, and it was very much uh, in that sort of vein of a, of a mechanical um, mechanical outlook. But just as with the English materialists, or even to a greater degree, considering the the uh, the emphasis upon scientific investigation that these great materialists placed, um, you can't really blame it upon the French materialists themselves. I mean, the the, the level of science was such that uh, um, the whole world outlook was effective. You know, the whole out outlook of science was effectively undialectical. Species were regarded as completely static in the same form that they had been given to us since the uh, the, the origins of the uh, of the Earth. Um, it was it was regarded that the, basically the Earth goes around the Sun as as do the, all the other planets and have done for all eternity in exactly the same sort of rotations. Um, it, it, it was only uh, Kant who really came up with the idea of the nebula hypothesis of the origins of the solar system. A brilliant idealist philosopher, actually, uh, but his ideas were not widely accepted. Actually, until the start of the 20th century, that the, the 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 acceptance of the nebula hypothesis of the origin of the solar system became widespread, and then, of course, uh, you know, geology didn't even exist as a science really. Uh, that either we had had these geological features that we see around us for all eternity, um, or they had been created by great biblical uh, catastrophes. Um, this was kind of like the, uh, the the fundamental uh, outlook of the time, and these were the this was the level of science basically, and and it's no wonder, of course, that the French materialists reflected that level of uh, science. Uh, although it should be said, um, they there are brilliant uh, dialectical insights in the great writings of the French materialists. So, for example, I recommend reading D'Alembert's uh, conversations with Diderot or Diderot's conversations with D'Alembert, um, where uh, Diderot actually. Um, hypothesizes that species have evolved. They've evolved from other species. It's quite remarkable, really. It's far ahead of his time, considering he's writing in the middle of the 18th century, about uh, you know, a bit less than a century uh, before uh, the origins of the species came out. Um, so of course it's it's no it's no wonder that they uh, suffered from these limitations and of course the the overriding limitation of, of French materialism was precisely the fact that they were the ideological trailblazers of the great French Revolution, of a bourgeois revolution, in other words, um, and uh, uh, you know they they were in order to to raise the nation basically to raise the population 
uh, for a struggle against the Ancien Regime, it was necessary to, to raise the, the, the possibility of fighting for the liberation of humanity, not the liberation of a particular class. These great thinkers were, of course, fighting for the liberation of humanity as a whole. That was, the, that was precisely what inspired them. But of course, it wasn't. The, the French Revolution would not end with the liberation of humanity. Uh, it, would, it would achieve the liberation, at least not in the immediate term, it achieved the, the liberation of the bourgeois class. And itself was shown to be, in the, in the, in the, in, you know, given enough time, it, it too was shown to be irrational. It had its irrational elements also. Um, you know, the kingdom of reason what became basically the bourgeois republic. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the rights of man were really the rights of bourgeois man, the rights to enjoy private property. Um, and it, the, the utopian socialists used the same method as the French materialists and the, and the rationalists of the Enlightenment to basically uh, um, argue precisely that capitalism is just as irrational as, uh, as, as uh, yeah, it's just as irrational as the Ancien Regime, as the feudal regime which fundamentally came before it. These, these ideas were, in a, in a manner of speaking, only semi-materialist, um, and precisely for this reason, because they were the ideas of the, the bourgeois revolution, because they sought to liberate humanity in the abstract. They talked about the rights of man in the abstract. Reason and rationality were abstract ideas that were basically, you know, reason could, could, could uh, we could draw out reasonable conclusions at any period in time. It was only because these thinkers happened to be born in the 18th century that the ideas of the rights of man, the social contract, and all of these sort of things of a harmonious social order were really discovered in the 18th century rather than, say, the 15th century or something like this. And the utopian socialist fundamentally applies the same method. You know, they, they looked around at capitalism and they decided it was equally irrational. Uh, you know, the, the great satanic mills, the poverty, the, the slums, all of these things. And they were right, of course. Capitalism did have the, that element of, of irrationality in it. It had a class contradiction within it. But of course, in the period of the 18th century and the, 19th, and the early 19th century, um, there was a great deal of truth to what the, the French materialists were saying, because of course, the, the, uh, uh, to, 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 to quote Hegel, all that is rational is real. And all that, therefore, the, 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 conclu the, the obverse of that is that all that is irrational is unreal. The, uh, it was precisely because the, the old feudal system and the trappings of the old feudal system were coming into conflict with the needs of society, that it was irrational, it needed to be overthrown. And they were correct, of course, in that analysis. But that was not a timeless statement about feudalism and, and capitalism um, as, as social orders. This was a historical truth, of course, uh, and it had its historical, libera its historical uh, limitations. And uh, the point is that today, um, of course, it is capitalism which has uh, become irrational, which is in conflict, basically, with the interests of society as a whole. And it is the proletariat, it is the working class, which, is, which, which carries on its shoulders, basically, the destiny of humanity, which is the ascending uh, uh, revolutionary class, and which has nothing to be afraid of from the truth, from rational insight, and from reason, basically. But these are not, of course, now understood as uh, a historical historical, uh, timeless truths, basically, but historical truths about the, uh, where class society has come to in its culmination in capitalism, basically. And uh, it's precisely as Lenin said, you know, that the reason that Marxism appears all powerful is precisely because it is true. And the capitalist class today, they don't, the truth is not on their side. The truth actually speaks against them, which is why, you know, in, in academia, in, you know, the Frankfurt School, the postmodernists, they all turn their back on the Enlightenment because these, these, these men and women, they fought for truth, they fought for rationality, they fought for an insight into the workings of the world. And the, ins the insight that uh, genuine science gives us into the working of society is that capitalism is a doomed system that must be overthrown. And therefore they turn their back upon rationality, they turn their back upon ins on, on reason and these sort of things. But I, I think um, we should, yeah, we, we should gladly allow them to, to, to turn, back, turn their backs on that tradition of the Enlightenment because these men and women, these were giants who I think we can claim as part of our tradition. They fought in their own manner. In, uh, they fought honestly for the liberation of humanity, not just materially, but spiritually, intellectually, as we are fighting for the liberation of humanity spiritually and intellectually ourselves. And, and some of them paid terrible, a terrible price for it, the ultimate price for it. You know, people like Galileo uh, and people like Giordano Bruno, uh, um, 
um, uh, um, you know, uh, like Spinoza and others, um, they were great revolutionaries within the limitations that they had, of course, which were the limitations of their time. And we, you know, if the, if the bourgeois want to cast them aside and say that they don't want them as part of their tradition, well, we will say that, you know, Marxism stands on the shoulders of these great giants as well. Not just Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, but yeah, also Giordano Bruno, yes, also Galileo. Uh, and, and, and if you, if you want, you know, uh, Bacon and Descartes and all of these great thinkers, of course, also form part of our revolutionary tradition from which, you know, Marxism is the distilled essence of all of these, you know, fantastic ideas that uh, uh, also preceded it. So on that, I think I'll finish.